Good afternoon, um, and thank you, Daria Gretzinko, Andrei Indugayev, Eva Kortanimi, and other members of the organizing committee. I'm delighted to be with you here today and to be able to um, help join with you in these early conversations. Uh, let me see here. What have digital networks wrought? And what are they doing today? Indeed, as Daria has so kindly introduced, I can imagine no finer form with which to begin to discuss these conversations than in the geopolitical pivot point of the 20th century, Helsinki. Um, and indeed, with you, um, uh, th those of us who can reflect on the geopolitics of this past century, um, no less uh, now 50 years um, uh, from the moment when the first long distance computer network was established this Tuesday, by the way, um, October 29th, 1969. Journalists, it's not too late to get your deadlines uh, met if you want to get a story on this. Um, but really, we have an opportunity to think about the kind of ongoing midlife crisis of the internet and to reflect, if we would, upon its consequences. My comments today will take a largely U-shaped curve. We're going to begin at the most abstract big picture, zoom in through a dramatic distillation of my most recent book, a copy of which I'll leave in the book exhibit, um, all the way down to the arrangement of the chairs in the Pullet Bureau on October 1st, 1970, uh, about a year later, before zooming back out to consider what we might learn in the process. So to the big picture. The cosmos, I want to argue, has been unevenly distributing power and knowledge for a long time and the internet is the most recent chapter of this. In seven far too easy pre-internet chapters, first, the Big Bang created particle matters, second, stars then consolidated and generated through nucleosynthesis, all elements heavier than helium in the universe. These stars, the cradle and tomb of matter, then spun off material for th our third chapter, planets, a few of which astronomers are now seeing for the first time outside of our solar system. On our planet, Photosynthesis, chapter four, then created bioenergy stores uh, for both plant and then animal life. And then fifth chapter, the domestication of fire created unevenly cal calorie stores in the cooking of meat and other things for bipedal mammals like ourselves, uh, which difference was then exacerbated chapter six in the agricultural revolution through the uneven storage of grain, foodstuff, and human settlements. Then comes, of course, seventh, the industrial and capitalist revolutions, uh, um, where we see the uneven concentration of capital even further in the means of production. Now, here we are, uh, staring down at the first generations of what might be the eighth chapter of an information revolution. No part of the globe, not even the Arctic, uh, in the Eurasian space has been spared of these changes. And we have a chance to reflect what are the consequences and causes of the uneven concentration of knowledge, information, and data today. If we were to begin our story in the 1990s, we might get stuck with what Lawrence Lessig once called the libertarian gotcha. That is the false promise that rapid deregulation will somehow promise unfettered freedoms and information prosperity for all. When in fact, seen in the larger cosmological story that I'm telling, we can see clear logics of uh, material, light, fuel, food, capital, uh, uh, and now information concentration into the hands of the few and often unscrupulous. Must it be so? What else might the internet look like? Perhaps we might look, if we could, to pr the grandest experiment, at least in recent times, in the social redistribution of wealth, namely Soviet state socialism and its attempts to network its nation. This history that I'll re tell requires no pivot, no counterfactual, no rewriting of history. The story of, as Slava Gorovich calls it, the Soviet internet, or perhaps internet, uh, takes seriously the designs of capitalism in industry on its face. That is its goal. Indeed, we might see through its story a kind of Shklovskian astranyinia from our own internet culture. Uh, what else might an alt-internet culture look like? Namely, in How Not to Network a Nation, The Uneasy History of the Soviet Internet, I argue that Soviet scientists tried for decades to network their nation, and what stalemated them is now fracturing the global internet. This story. On the morning of the 1st of October, 1970, the computer scientist Viktor Glushkov walked into the Kremlin to meet the Politburo. 
He was an alert man with piercing eyes, rimmed in black glasses, with the kind of mind that, given one problem, would immediately set about deriving a method to solve all similar problems. And at the moment, the Soviet Union had a problem. A year earlier, the United States had launched the ARPANET, the first packet switch distributed computer network that would in time seed the internet as we know it. This distributed network was originally designed uh, to nudge the US ahead of the Soviets and also to allow its scientists and computer and government leaders, um, computers at least, to communicate even in the event of a nuclear attack. It was at the height of the tech race, the Soviets needed to respond. Lushkov's general idea was to inaugurate an era of electronic socialism. He named his colossally ambitious project or the All-State Automated System. It sought to streamline and technologically upgrade the entire planned economy. This grand system would still make economic decisions by state plans, not market prices, but would be sped up by computer modeling to predict market equilibria before they happened. Lushkov wanted smarter, faster decision making, and maybe even electronic currency. All he needed was the Politburo's purse. When Glushkov entered the room that morning, he noticed two empty chairs at the long table. His two closest allies were missing. Instead, he faced down a table of steely-eyed ministers, many of whom wanted the Politburo's purse for themselves. Between 1959 and 1989, leading men and women of Soviet state and science repeatedly ventured to construct a national computer network for broadly pro-social or civilian purposes. Context, with the deep wounds of the Second World War far from healed, the Soviet Union continued to specialize, and this is one among them, in massive modernization projects that had transformed a dispersed Tsarist nation of uh, relatively illiterate peasants into a global nuclear power in the course of a couple generations. And after the Soviet Union's uh, Nikita Khrushchev had denounced the personality cult of Stalin in 1956, a sense of possibility, often a cybernetic one, swept the country. And onto the scene entered a host of socialist projects to wire the national economy uh, with computer networks. Among them, the first proposal anywhere in the world to create a national computer network for civilians. This idea was the brainchild of the military researcher, curiously, Anatoly Ivanovich Kitov. A young man with a small build and a keen mind for mathematics, Kitov had risen through the ranks of the Red Army in the Second World War. Then, in 1952, he had encountered Norbert Wiener's masterwork, Cybernetics, in a secret military library. The book's title, A Neologism from the Greek for Steersman, and itself the name of a post-war science uh, for self-governing information systems. Then, with the support of two senior scientists, Kitov translated cybernetics into a robust Russian language vocabulary of, uh, for developing self-governing control and communication systems with computers. This supple systems vocabulary of cybernetics was intended to equip the Soviet state with uh, the high-tech toolkit for rational Marxist governance a kind of antidote to the violence and cult of personality characterizing the previous regime. Indeed, perhaps cybernetics might even ensure that there never would again be another strongman dictator, or so goes the technocratic dream. In 1959, as the director of a secret military computer research center, Kitov turned his attention to devoting what he called unlimited quantities of reliable calculating processing power to better planning the national economy which was probably the most persistent information coordination problem at besetting the Soviet project at the time. For example, it was discovered in 1962 that a handmade error in the census had uh, goofed the population prediction by about four million. Kitov wrote his thoughts down about what computer networks might be able to do in what he called the Red Book Letter, which he then sent off to Khrushchev. He proposed allowing, quote, civilian organizations to use functioning military computer complexes, the word for networks before networks, for economic planning in the nighttime hours when most military men would be sleeping. Here he thought economic planners could harness the computational surplus of the military to adjust for census or economic plan problems nightly, tweaking them in real time as needed. He named this dual use military civilian national computer network the Economic Automated Management System. As it happened, Kitov's military supervisors intercepted the Red Book letter before it reached Khrushchev. Uh, 
and they were incensed by his proposal that the Red Army would share resources with civilian economic planners, resources that Kitov no less had dared to criticize as falling behind the times. A secret uh, military tribunal was arranged to review his transgressions, for which Kitov was promptly stripped of party membership uh, for a year and then dismissed from the military permanently. So ended the first national public computer network ever proposed. The idea, however, survived. In the early 1960s, another scientist took up Kitov's proposal, a man whom Kitov would grow close enough to that two decades later, their children would marry. Again, Viktor Mikhailovich Glushkov. The full title of Glushkov's plan, the All-State Automated System for the Gathering and Processing of Information for the Counting, Planning, and Governance of the National Economy, USSR, I think speaks for itself and its epic ambitions. First proposed in 1962, the All-State Automated System, or OGAS, uh, was intended to become a real-time, remote-access national computer network built on pre-existing and planned telephony wires. In its most ambitious version, it would span most of the Eurasian continent, mapping itself like a nervous system onto every factory and enterprise in the planned economy. Its network was modeled hierarchically after the three-level pyramid structure of state and economy. One central computer center in Moscow would connect to as many as 200 mid-level, here you can see about 15 for context, computer centers in prominent cities, which would then in turn link to as many as 20,000 computer terminals distributed throughout factories and key production sites in the national economy. Here you can see in the bottom right the three, not the links, but the three um, hierarchical tierings of the different sites. And consonant with Glushkov's greater life work commitments, these plans reflected a deliberately decentralized design. This meant that, sure, Moscow could specify uh, which authorization which user received, but once you were authorized, you could then contact any other user on the decentralized pyramid without subsequent permission from the mother node. Glushkov intimately understood the advantages of lo leveraging local knowledge uh, given that he himself was an algebraist who worked on related mathematical problems for most of his career and spent much of his time ferrying between home and the capital. He once jokingly called the Kiev Moscow train his second home. The Ogas project appeared to many state officials, especially in the late 1960s, to be the de best next response to an old conundrum. Nobody, apparently since Marx or Engels, really knew how to get to, the, to communism. For Glushkov, networked com communing, computing excuse me, might just inch the country toward an age of what the author, Francis Spufford, has called Red Plenty. This is a beautiful book. I recommend it way before mine. It was the means by which the sluggish, pulp-based lifeblood of the command economy think quotas, plans, and wrist-bending compendiums of industry standards might be transformed into the nation's neural firings, moving at the sublime speed of electricity. This project signified for a few no less than the ushering in of electronic socialism. Such ambitions required committed people willing to try new ideas. And in the 1960s, some of those folks could be found here in the southern outskirts of Kiev, uh, where Glushkov ran the Institute of Cybernetics for 20 years, beginning in 1962. He filled this institute with young men and women. The average age was about 25 initially. Glushkov and his youthful staff dedicated themselves to developing the OGAS, as well as a host of other related cybernetic projects, one of which was the attempt to virtualize hard currency uh, through a system of electronic receipts uh, that would indeed serve as a kind of online ledger of accounts, and this in the early 1960s. Glushkov, who is known to talk down party um, ideologues by quoting paragraphs of Marx from memory, which seems like a useful technique generally, once described this innovation of a kind of Soviet e currency as a faithful fulfillment of the Marxist prophecy that in a future socialism there would be no money, no hard currency. Unfortunately for Glushkov, the idea stirred up anxieties among the bureaucrats and did not receive committee approval, although the idea of a grand economic plan did live on project and network, did live to see another day. Throughout these cyberneticists imagined a kind of smart neural network, uh, a nervous system for the uh, Soviet economy. And this choice cybernetic analogy between computer network and brain bore its imprint on a host of computing innovations in Kiev. For example, instead of the so-called von Neumann bottleneck, uh, which limits the amount of transferable data in the data bus in a computer processor, 
Glushkov's team proposed what they called macro piping processing, modeled after the simultaneous firings of the brain's many neural synapses. Uh, in addition to countless mainframe computer projects, other theoretical schemes included automata theory, uh, the paperless office, I think a promise that has done more to benefit the paper industry than anybody else, but equally fit for both bureaucrat and businessmen, as well as natural language programming, which would offer programmers the opportunity to communicate through human language or semantically, not just syntactically, as programmers do today. And perhaps most ambitiously, Glushkov and his school uh, theorized what they called informazionnoye biesmertie, or information immortality, a concept that we might call mind uploading, with Arthur C. Clarke or Isaac Asimov in hand. For a resonant reflection on his deathbed two decades later, Glushkov comforted his grieving wife with the following words, be at ease, Valentina, he soothed her. One day the light from our earth will pass by constellations, and on each constellation we will appear young again. Thus we will live together forever in the eternities. If there isn't a more succinct uh, summary of mid-century cosmism, I don't know it. Uh, after their workday, the cyberneticists also indulged in a comedy club, club full of frivolity, even uh, merry pranksterism that occasionally bordered on the outright defiant. No more than a place to vent off steam, their after-hours work club also saw itself as a virtual country independent of Moscow's rule. They christened their group Cybertonia, Kibertonia, on a New Year's party in 1960 and organized fairly frequent social events, holiday dances, symposia, conferences in Kiev and Lviv, even publishing tongue-in-cheek papers such as on remaining invisible, at least to the authorities. Instead of event invitations, the group issued pun-filled faux passports, wedding certificates, uh, newsletters, you may know Vecherniya Kiev, which this is punning off of Kiber, punch card currency, and even a uh, Cybertonia constitution. And in the parody of the Soviet or Soviet, the council governance structure, Cybertonia was governed by a council of robots, uh, at the head of which sat their mascot and supreme leader, a saxophone plane robot perhaps a nod to both the US cultural import of jazz as well as the intellectual mode of mathematical improvisation. Glushkov himself was a bit of a restless soul, having titled his memoirs Despite the Authorities, although his official, his official title was also Vice President of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. I think as we can begin to see in this Soviet case study, uh, counterculture, as it's been understood in the scholarship of Fred Turner, as the power to both count and counter other cultures, has long been kin to cyberculture. All of this required money, and lots of it, especially for the Ogas project. And this meant that the Politburo had to give it to them. And so it is that we find Glushkov back in the Kremlin on the 1st of October, 1970, hoping to continue the work of Cybertonia and to, drink, and to bring the internet to a bedraggled Soviet state. At least one man stood in Garbuzov's day, uh, way that day, the, excuse me, Glushkov's way that day, the Minister of Finance, Vasily Garbuzov. Garbuzov did not want any sh shiny, real-time, optimized computer networks governing or informing this, uh, the state economy, which his Ministry of Finance oversaw. He called instead for simple computers that would instead flash lights and play music, such as he had seen on a recent visit to hen houses in Minsk. These motivations were not born out of a common sense pragmatism, however legitimate they may have been, but rather he wanted the funding for his own ministry. Rumor holds that he had approached before the, 19, the 1st of October gathering, the uh, economic reform-minded prime, prime minister, Alexei Kosygin, in private, and threatened him that if his competitor ministry, Pyotr Starovsky's Central Statistical Administration, retained control, over the Ogas project and its likely billions of rubles, then Garbuzov in the Ministry of Finance would do their best to internally submarine any economic reform efforts that might follow from it. A threat that he had made good on five years earlier uh, with uh, Kasigan's piecemeal liberalization reform efforts. Thus, Glushkov needed allies to face down Garbuzov and to keep the Soviet internet alive, but there were none at the meeting. This is a story of contingency. The two seats left empty that day were the Prime Ministers, as well as the Technocratic General Secretary Leonid Brezhnev. These two men were likely, although unlikely allies together, were both 
the two most powerful men in the Soviet state, as well as likely supporters of the Ogas in 1970. But apparently, they chose to be absent rather than to face down a ministry mutiny. Garbuzov successfully convinced the Politburo uh, that the Ogas project, with its ambitious plans to optimally model and manage the information economy, was simply too much too soon. And the committee, after nearly going the other way, felt it was safer to support Garbuzov. And the still top secret uh, Ogas project was left to languish in review limbo for another decade. I argue that the forces that brought down the Ogas resemble those that eventually undid the Soviet Union, surprisingly informal uh, forms of institutional misbehavior. Subversive ministers, in this case status quo inclined bureaucrats, nervous factory managers, uh, confused workers, uh, and even other economic reformers opposed the Ogas because it was simply in their institutional self-interest to do so. Thus, without state funding or oversight, the National Network Project for ushering in elect electronic socialism splintered into a patchwork, not a network, of uh, in the 70s and 80s of dozens and then hundreds of non-interoperable, isolated local area control, control systems spread throughout factories. The Soviet state, in short, failed to network their nation, not because it was too rigid or top-down in design, but because it was too fickle and pernicious in practice. There is an irony to this. The first global computer networks took root in the US thanks to well-regulated state funding and collaborative research environments, while the contemporary and notably independent national network efforts in the USSR floundered due to unregulated competition and institutional infighting among Soviet bureaucrats. The first global computer networks, in short, emerged thanks to capitalists behaving like cooperative socialists, not socialists behaving like competitive capitalists. In this uneasy reversal with which my book begins, we can begin to glimpse, I think, not only an explanation for the upside downness of the Soviet internet case, but also a clear and present warning for our own network society today. Today, the internet, understood as a single global network of networks, perhaps a useful vehicle for advancing, insert what you will, information, liberty, commerce, democracy, is indeed in serious decline. Consider how often companies and countries alike seek to silo our online experience. The ubiquitous app that populates your pockets is far more of a walled garden for rent seeking than it is a public commons for browsing. Inward gravity wells, such as Facebook and the Chinese firewall, increasingly gobble up sites eager to link outward. So too, quite understandably, are the heads of France, Russia, and other countries eager to internationalize ICANN, or the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, and to enforce local regulations. In fact, we see even more broadly that hundreds of non-internet networks have been functioning quite well for decades. The future of computing network undoubtedly holds not one internet, but many distinct online ecosystems. In other words, the future undoubtedly resembles the past. The 20th century, too, features multiple competing national computer networks clamoring for global status. The Cold War drama of what we might dub with a wink Soviet networking helps to fill in a kind of neg uh, internet negative 1.0 um, comparative case study and the history of computer networks. And weighed in the balance of many past and likely future networks, the perception that there's only one single global network of networks is clearly the historical exception. Given that the Cold War irony at the heart of this story, namely cooperative capitalists outmaneuvered competitive socialists, did not play well for the Soviets of yesteryear, there is absolutely no guarantee that the internet of tomorrow or today, no matter how we frame our ideologies, which should do any better. Consider, as I think Daria and Marco were suggesting, that the, uh, the, as once quipped the anthropologist and philosopher Bruno Latour, technology is society made durable. By which I think he meant that social values are embedded in technologies. For example, Google's page rank, the heart of its search algorithm, is deemed so-called democratic because, among many other factors, it counts links and sites uh, and links to links um, as votes. And like politicians with votes, this uh, page with the most links ranks the highest in the search results. The internet in this guise appears a kind of vehicle for liberty or democracy of some sort. 
But I think this is in part because those values cemented themselves in the historical accident that is the 1990s, just as our Western popular imagination appeared to uh, kind of cement around the triumph of uh, these Western values in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. But the story of the Soviet internet also reverses Latour's aphorism. So too is society technology made temporary. In other words, as our social values shift, so too will what appears obvious about technology. The Soviets once embedded values into their network projects, cybernetic collectivism, statist hierarchy, planned economies that may seem foreign to us today. So too will the values that modern listeners attach to the internet today strike future readers and observers as strange. Network technologies will endure and uh, evolve doubtlessly even as our fondest social assumptions about them pass into the dustbin of history. Glushkov's uh, story is also a stirring reminder to the investor classes and other agents of technological change that astonishing genius, far-seeing foresight, and political acumen are not enough to change the world. Supporting institutions often make all the difference. Indeed, perhaps we can say that the institutional values behind networks uh, matter far more than the design values that we might attribute to them. The ARPANET never sought to empower surveillance of citizens, a fact in the language that the Soviet OGAS project was far more comfortable with, and yet the heir of the first and not the second has gone on to enchain the world in its two smart protocols. Excuse me. I hope now to zoom out a little bit farther and to um, uh, ask larger questions about the uh, privatization forces and the institutional logics that have spelled not only the end of Soviet electronic socialism, but might in fact threaten to end our own chapter of a networked age. My one, if every keynote is offered one conference intellectual provocation, as Dar Daria so nicely put it, I would like to propose uh, that we might be engaged in a conversation around global north theory, by which I mean uh, to borrow from and to build on the post-colonial language of the global south, to emphasize indeed the mistakes and the vainglorious vices of a Western imagination of technology, Indeed, if we to look across the Northern Hemisphere, which includes about 90% of the world's population, but in particular Slavic, Northern European, and North American traditions of media and technology, in particular perhaps the Canadian media theory group, um, of course we're missing much of the uh, Asian story here, uh, um, I see an opportunity to offer what might be an intellectual counterbalance or a counterweight to the rise of unchecked network and technology values. Two projects uh, towards this larger conversation. First, a volume uh, forthcoming uh, from MIT Press, Your Computer is on Fire, which I'm editing with the uh, good folks in italics here. It seeks to articulate critical stances on computing and new media outside of a traditional Western frame. And uh, second, my own personal book project uh, right now at the moment is a proverbial stupid history of smart technology in the Soviet century. And it seeks to critically recapture the story of how technology came, became so-called smart and to examine the captains of intellect and industry in the global north and how they have pedestaled often the image of the mind and in particular the strategic male mind um, as a kind of a metonym for smart identity discourse. This book then challenges that discourse by showing how that mind-computer imagery often relies on interdisciplinary small groups or thought labs. This uh, book, which I'm tentatively calling The Computer is Not a Brain, seeks to show how behind the current celebration and anxieties of smart technologies, artificial intelligence, learning algorithms, and the rest, lies a much longer history of neurohubris and mental machismo. Perhaps a more sustainable and field, humane field foundation for our own work, as well as the work of thinking about computers, culture, and society in the Eurasian space might emerge from more humane examinations of how computing became at once s smart and so toxic. I'll leave you now with a quote uh, uh, from where, uh, and leaving you off where we began, namely turning away from the narcissistic cultures of uh, kind of individualistic culture that often dominates the world of the internet and turning instead to the greater, perhaps even cosmological means by which we as a species have to reach out to our, uh, one another. Uh, namely a quote from the great and late Ursula Le Guin, I hope to have sounded out in this talk as well as in others, the voices of those who have seen 
who have seen alternatives to how we live now and can see through our fear-stricken society and its obsessive technologies to other ways of being and even imagine some real grounds for hope. Thank you.